This webinar is the second one uh, that we have with regard to the Interoperability Academy. I see that some participants already participated uh, to the previous one, so really welcome all. Basically, the, the idea of today, uh, it's of course to introduce to you uh, the team that is behind uh, the Interoperability Academy project. Also to make a quick uh, recap about uh, the policy context in which this project is taking place. And definitely you will see that's one of the goal of this webinar is that we are not, uh, we are trying definitely not to reinvent the wheel. So we are trying to build synergies with other um, initiatives basically. And in this, uh, in this webinar, we would like to put the highlight, especially on the, co the cooperation that we are uh, having with the EU Academy. There will be a specific part about it. And also with the, the team uh, of DG employment of the European Commission working on ESCO. Uh, of course, there will be few, few, we want also to present to you some of the, some of the latest achievement. And uh, one of them being the first course um, of our academy. Um, so you will see there the, the will be a presentation about it. Uh, also, definitely a presentation about ESCO and how it is linked uh, to our project. And we also would like during this webinar to share with you uh, our roadmap. So what is expected, what is planned for the, for the future in the short, medium and long term, basically. Uh, of course, it's not only uh, a we will not only be in a presentation mode, as I mentioned. The idea is really to discuss and exchange uh, with all of you to get your feedback, uh, to, 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 to get also your impression on how the project, in which uh, direction the project is going. We would like also to see if some of you may be interested to test uh, the first course, but also the, the upcoming ones. Uh, of course, listening from you based on your experience, what are your suggestions for uh, any potential courses that may be helpful within your organization? And of course, still uh, discussing with you about possibilities for collaboration. This is really a project, as I mentioned, that is based uh, on synergies. We don't want to be uh, to, to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to create content that may be already available in some uh, other places. And this is really why synergies and collaboration with all of you is um, really a cornerstone of this uh, project. So we can move to next slide, and probably just um, what what we will do. We can do a very short uh, roundtable because we have some participants that were already there uh, in the previous webinar. But I see that we have also some new participants, so that may be good to to understand exactly who is who. Um, I will just shortly introduce uh, the team. So, so basically, we have as a project owner Natalia Aristimuno Perez, who is head of unit uh, of Digit D2 of the European Commission. And Natalia will uh, be pr pr giving you an overview of the policy context in very few minutes. Uh, also, as project officers, we have uh, Georges Lobo and Victoria Kalogiru that will also present uh, during this webinar. And they, they are the ones that are really following um, the development of this project on a, on a day to day basis. Uh, then, from the contractor side, so I'm Ludovic Mayo working for Trussis International and I'm the project manager uh, of the team. And as you can see on the slide, so we have a team that is composed by uh, several consultants uh, of Trussis International, but we are also, uh, we have also in the team. Uh, more uh, people with academic background from uh, especially from KUL, the Catholic University of Leuven, and we have also Professor uh, Demetrios Samson. So, so this is for our part, I would say. Uh, now what, why, what I propose is really to, to quickly uh, make this round table. So just to understand where, where, where are you from and what you are doing uh, basically in your day-to-day -day activities. So what I propose is to start just by uh, alphabetical order, so it will be uh, easier for everyone. And probably if we do that, we can start uh, with Miguel Alvarez Rodriguez, who will also present one part of this webinar. Miguel, do you want to say a few words? Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Ludovic. Uh, 
My name is Miguel Alvarez. Um, I'm an official of the commission working in the unit and interoperability unit and in Digital and soon um, experience implement uh, training uh, training course uh, on the European Interoperability Framework. I'm responsible for the National Interoperability Framework Observatory, and as part of this project, we decided to create this uh, course. I will give you more information later on. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, okay, so we already introduced uh, Natalia, who will take over uh, one part of this uh, webinar. So I propose that we move directly to Cecil Guache. Cecil, do you want to say a few words? Just uh, do not. Uh, hello. Yes. Yeah, so I'm I'm working, um, helping Miguel, and also part of the legal interoperability action that would like to benefit from the uh, fr from the uh, the academy. So I'm here more as an observer. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Cecile. Then we have Dimitrios. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dimitrios Pikios. I'm the uh, project coordinator of uh, ESCO. I will do a presentation further down uh, this uh, webinar. I work in unit uh, E2 of uh, DJ employment, and our unit is responsible for uh, skills and qualifications within our DG. And uh, together with uh, the whole team, some members of the team are joining us uh, today. We're really looking forward to, to support the Interoperability Academy team uh, in this project. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Dimitrios. We can then move to Dimitris Panopoulos. Just do not forget that you are on mute, so you need to unmute yourself to, if you want to say a few words. Okay, so Dimitris Panopoulos. Okay, we can then move and we can come back to Dimitris. So we have Eva Kobos. Eva? Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Eva Kobos. I work in the CEMIC project and I'm here because in the months to come, we'll also prepare materials for the Interoperability Academy. Really good, thank you. Let's, let's move next, Felix Pozzo. Hello, I'm Felix and I'm part of Dimitrios team, of the ESCO team, and I'm here also as an observer. Thank you, Felix, for joining. We have also Michel Ick from the GRC in ISPRA. Yes, good morning. I'm Michel Ick from the GRC ISPRA. I am a project manager, part of the project core team uh, of the solution provider for the EU Academy project, uh, so at technical levels. And uh, I am here uh, with Paul Hearn of the GRC to, to watch your, your webinar. Really good. Thank you, Michel, for joining. We can then move uh, to Ilias Katsagunos, who already participated to the previous webinar and workshop. Ilias, the floor is yours. Good morning to all. Ilias, I'm from the European Security and Defense College. I'm the e-learning manager of the, of the college. We deliver the trainings to all the member states. And it's a Great pleasure working with you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Pleasure for us to have you on board. Ludo, you forgot uh, Delfina Suarez. Ah, uh, probably I yeah, I didn't uh, see her. But Delfina, of course, uh, I don't see you in the list, basically. But Delfina, do you want to say a few words? Yes, good morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I'm Delfina Suarez. I'm the head of uh, UNUE Gov. UNUE Gov is an operating unit of the United Nations University. Uh, we are located in the north of Portugal, and basically we conduct <coughs> research, advisory, and uh, capacity building activities in the area of uh, electronic governance. We are very happy in attending this uh, uh, second web, web seminar. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks to you for joining. Uh, let's go back to Laura. We have Laura Vesavizan. Yes, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for this webinar. I am part of the ESCO team uh, on the contractor side, and I'm really looking forward to, to your feedback on, on ESCO. Thank you. Really good, thank you. Let's move to Nick Achilleopoulos. Hi, good morning, all. I am Nick Achilleopoulos. I work for the Hellenic Open University. And we're um, experienced in dealing with all matters that have to do with online learning systems and 
have also uh, actively participated in uh, Digital Skills and Job Coalition here in Greece and in uh, in the Commission and uh, uh, are interested here in seeing how we can help in establishing, uh, let's say, the educational part of the Academy, also in terms of e-learning technologies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Really good, thank you. Then we have also Nora from uh, the EU Academy team. Uh, yes, hello and good morning. Yeah, I'm Nora Ganescu. I don't know how to change the, the, the name on the screen, but my name is Nora Ganescu. I work uh, in the GRC and I am part of the team, uh, of the business team of the EU Academy. And we uh, work together. Uh, together very close uh, with ISA Squared, and I'm very excited to, to be part of this webinar and uh, yeah, contribute if I can. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Good to have you on board. Uh, we then have Pierre-Henri from the Interoperability Unit. Hello to all. Um, yes, I'm, I belong to the D2 from the Commission. Uh, I take care of uh, the newsletter, among other things. Um, I'm very interested in this in your project uh, because uh, I'm a former French teacher, so I will follow all uh, your progress. And one day I expect uh, to be uh, one ac academician of the, your academy. Thanks. Really good, thank you. So we are now reaching the last uh, participants. So let's move to Pantelis Nicolaidis. Do you want to say a few words about you? It seems that Pantelis is on mute. Okay. Good morning to everybody. My name is Lee. I'm an advisor to General Secretary of Interior at the Ministry of Interior, responsible for the public sector. And now I'm working on a special project uh, named uh, uh, Rebrain and Western uh, Western Greece. Uh, the project is uh, uh, targeted to regional development based on uh, digital uh, skills and, of course, human resources is, uh, is uh, at the center of uh, uh, its aim, uh, along with uh, EAP and Mr. Achilopoulos and Dimitris Panopoulos, the Ministry of uh, we design uh, our uh, skills academy and of course it is very very interesting uh, for all of us to be part of the of your webinars of course we uh, intend to for <laughs> closer collaboration thank you very much thank you thanks a lot uh, we are then moving to another member of the eu academy that will be a presenter for today paul hearn from the grc paul Yes, hello, uh, good morning everybody. I'm really, really happy to be here and support the work of the Interoperability Academy and your community. So I'm Paul Hearn, I'm the, the business manager of the EU Academy project. I guess it's fair to say the person who started it. Um, so I'm very happy to share a bit later a bit more information about that. Thank you, Paul. We are then uh, moving to another participant who actively participated to the previous webinar. So Robert Kremer. Yeah, thank you for, for giving me the floor. So I'm very happy to be here today uh, as a professor of e-governance at Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. Of course, it's not only just being in Estonia that qualifies me to be here. I think I was invited up on the work that we do for the uh, large scale pilot, the once only principal project, uh, which is uh, which which prepared the grounds for the technical infrastructure for the upcoming single digit gateway regulation, which will become live in some three years time. Uh, and uh, next to that, I'm also working, we're working very closely together with Kao Leuven on the pu public sector innovation and e-governance master program, which we also call Pioneer, uh, that we uh, brought to life together with Job Crumpets, who is also a part of this project. So I'm very happy to be here and also see so many nice and dear colleagues. Uh, and uh, yeah, looking forward to our webinar. Thank you, Robert. We are glad to have you on board. Uh, okay, and then I see that we have also uh, Monika Sovinska from Digit. Monika, do you want to say a few words about you? 
Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, I'm just interested uh, in the progress of this project, and of course, I am potential uh, user of the academy and contributor in the future. So this is why I'm here, and I wish you a very nice webinar. Thank you, Monica, for participating. Uh, we can then move to one colleague, also from Digit, Sofia. Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Sofia Sirani, and I'm working uh, together with the ISAT Square team. Uh, specifically, my um, action is about legal interoperability, and we are looking for preparing uh, uh, a training around that. So we are really curious uh, with my team, with Cecil and Isa, uh, to, to learn uh, about the plans. So I will be here as an observer. Thank you. Thank you, Sofia. Uh, three more participants. Uno Wallner is the next one. Uno. Uh, uh, good morning. My name is Uno Wallner. Uh, I am working uh, for uh, e-governance academy, Estonia. Thank you, Uno. We we then have uh, Isa von Kalben. Yeah, hello. Um, I was already present. I'm Isa from also from the legal interoperability team with Sofia, uh, who just presented what we are about what it's about, what we want to do with the interoperability at the Academy. Looking forward to a good webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Isa. And last but not least, we have also Yanis uh, Sharalabidis. So Yanis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ludovic. Um, I'm a professor of digital governance in uh, the University of the Aegean in Samos, in Greece. And uh, I'm dealing with interoperability matters who the last 15 years. Um, and uh, I'm also teaching interoperability at pre-graduate and post-graduate level. Thank you, Yanis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we have made, uh, I think, our, our tour. If there is anyone who didn't have the chance to, to introduce himself or herself, please do not hesitate to do it now. L Ludovic, there was in the chat uh, the person who had no mic and he presented, if you can read it loud, what he wrote in the chat. Uh, yes, sure. I will then uh, move to the chat. I didn't see it, but yeah. Dimitris uh, Panopoulos, okay, so apparently uh, has an issue with the, the mic, but he's a data analyst of labor market in the labor market diagnosis mechanism and uh, from the ministry, uh, within the Ministry of Labor in Greece. So thanks a lot for, for participating, uh, even in a muted mode, let's say. Um, OK, so now I think we have been uh, through all the participants. I just see that we have Vicky Margariti, who just joined us now. So Vicky, we were doing a round table. If you want to take a few seconds to, to introduce yourself, please feel free to do it. It seems that you are on mute, Vicky. Okay, so it seems that there is probably another uh, issue with microphone. I propose that then we can uh, we can directly move uh, to the next part of this webinar to really enter into the content. But again, we are 30 participants, so really glad to have all of you on board. Really a lot of different organizations, a lot of different backgrounds. So I'm really excited to see the good discussion that we will have in the coming two hours. And uh, now it will be my turn to mute my microphone and I will give the floor to one of the two project officers, Victoria Kalogiru. Victoria, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Ludo, for the um prolonging and also for describing shortly and briefly what we are up to do today. Uh, also, we would like to thank all of you that uh, you really um, came here today to, to hear about our workshop and also the possibility because we already discussed all together how we can collaborate and as Ludo said, not to reinvent the wheel. So in a nutshell, what we want to do here today. So uh, we had also already another webinar that was in uh, April and Initially on this, we wanted to see what, what were the achievements of, of the Operability Academy that we have done. For instance, we have already a workshop, we have uh, found all the materials so far, and also discuss future plans and also see your feedback, and not only the deliverables, but also the things that we want to do. Uh, building into this, the aim of today's we webinar is to, to highlight the importance of digital cooperation for the creation of Interoperability Academy, but also an academy for e-learning for interoperability, as already mentioned uh, um, already or with some of you. 
And then the, the million dollar question is how we can work uh, better together and collaborate to realize and expand this potential of digital environment for advancing uh, the digital skills of the public sector in European Union. So in, in order to be able to, to realize this, this ambitious, I will say, plan of developing the economy and implementing material produced other than the ISA Square and SEF program uh, in the beginning, uh, we have to, be, to bring together you know, different and diverse organizations from national and international level. This is not easy, but we found so far that there are several uh, commonalities that we can also bring and work together. But this means that we have embarked on a journey that to create bridges of interactions with all of you that you attend the works of today. So this is just the start, not just we co continue. It's important to see how we can minimize the digital skips gap and train civil servants and also young professionals and also provide specialized learning training programs, not just something that we just provide here today, something that can be sustainable in the future. And uh, the goal is to move towards mutually benefited and agreed common goals and also inserting the, the information that we all have and knowledge between all organizations. And also that means that we have to exchange data and also between our, our systems, our, our, um, uh, our uh, computer systems and our technologies, which sometimes is not easy, but we try to see how to do this. And speaking about this, you know, it's how to have that digital independent, independence, which is not so easy and also have interorganizational collaboration. And uh, further up to this, we're going to present the first course, some mock-ups that we, uh, we have uh, already created, and to see how to speed up and scale up the change of increasing thus. And also, what is the responsiveness and the scope of cooperation and governance mechanisms to need to, to rapidly improve? So this is more or less the, the scope of, uh, of today and what we want to, to to accomplish. Um, yeah. So what we did in the in the previous one. So shortly apart from this, I would like to briefly present what we did in the previous one because some of you weren't there and we want also to to recap and also say what we did in the previous one. I hope you can hear me because I don't. <laughs> so uh, Ludo, I don't know if it's the mic. Yes, so we, can, we can hear Perfect. you. Thank you. Loudly. Yeah, just to be sure, you know, sometimes. <laughs> so, what were the the key um, outcomes of the webinar one, what, which was in April? Uh, I will make a full stop here to say that we started uh, analyzing almost six months ago. Uh, and also, we have a workshop, a live workshop to, to gather also material on this. And the key aspects of the discussion was to, to gather and validate with all of you the requirements for interoperability academy, but also for the learning and management system, which is most convenient and most easy to use. The other thing we wanted to, to develop, and we did some uh, already material you will see in the link that Katarina already provided in the chat, we have developed some learning profiles and learning paths and curriculum that fits the public sector, but also the courses that we want to do for interoperability, because it's not just profiles, it's also what we also provide, because interoperability is just, it's just a sector on its own, so it, it links to several things. And also, we wanted to see what was the prior experience with the learning management the systems platform and features, so where the features were more, more, more used. And what were the main out outcomes, as you can see already in the, in the presentations? So we have already developed some learning profiles and learning parts that they were, most use, they were the most used and most relevant to, to participants and organizations and the, the ones that, that they, they were more in need. So that is why we came up to this. Uh, there were several uh, topics and courses that were suggested for all levels of knowledge and layers of interoperability and also the learning teams, what we mean. So we try to tackle the basic level, but also more advanced level, you know, for coming for someone that, for instance, has a legal background, and also someone that has like a very um, um, ICT or engineering background, or even physics, and try to, to combine it all together for interoperability course, because interoperability, in the end, combines all. So this is like something that builds the dots and links the dots together. So what we have found out that the learning management system platforms that were most used were like Moodle, uh, Backboard and Elias. And the majority of courses, although 
people like to have like um, multilingual multilingualism, the majority of them are still offered in English or translated in English. And also, in order to 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 develop the training mo mo modules, uh, the majority of participants they suggested that the module should be attractive to users with easy easy to digest solutions, so simple. Nothing in the beginning really that they have to struggle to find what is working. So this is in a nutshell uh, what we, we came up in the previous webinar. Of course, this is work in progress. It never stops. But this is the main and the initial uh, components that we we found out in our uh, first webinar. And all this was thanks to you. OK, audio is not good. Uh, I hope uh, for the others it was OK. I see on the chat that the audio is not so good. No, we, we could hear you loud and clear. OK, uh, and in any site, um, in any place that uh, we will uh, record the webinar and we'll try to correct it. So I'll have to go quickly why this was all this came and what is the reason and what is the future? And this is really important to see the the backbone of it, and the backbone is uh, the policy context. And on this, uh, it was a pleasure to having on board uh, our head of unit, Natalia Perez Aristimuno, that will present uh, the the policy context and the need of it, and more things to come. Thank you very much, Natalia. The floor is yours. I'm muting Thank myself. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, yeah. So. Indeed, what we are uh, or we will be talking today here uh, is part of a, a wider picture and um, well, uh, it was in February, but it looks like it was like 20 years ago <laughs> with the actual context. Um, uh, in February, the Commission uh, adopted uh, a, a package on uh, shaping Europe's digital future. And I would say that even if this happened before uh, the lockdown and uh, the, the the highest peak of the of the crisis, um, the digital um, or Europe's digital uh, future is is I would say is not even more a future, but is the present. And uh, this crisis has even emphasized even more the importance of of digital in in our in our. Um, communities. Um, so the, the vision was also on how we can uh, digitally empower, in, empower the citizens. So it is very important to have the citizens involved uh, in, uh, in, in digital and um, also how we can uh, make sure that the digital capacity of Europe is at the right level. Um, there, were, there are three pillars around this uh, this package uh, is technology that works for people. Um, and this you will see this comes uh, very often uh, uh, in, in all the, the communications that the Commission does. Fair and competitive economy, and even if this was adopted, as I said, um, in February, uh, this is still uh, or even uh, now more important than, than before. And uh, open, uh, democratic and sustainable society. So all these three pillars that were um, part of the communication uh, in, in February uh, are still uh, key and very important uh, today. And um, yeah, what is important perhaps is to, to have a focus, uh, let, let's have a focus on, on the technology that works uh, for people, where you will see um, uh, some of the actions or the, well, let, let's put the three key actions that were mentioned here. One is, um, I will start from from the from the down. <laughs> uh, uh, reinforce e-governments interoperability strategy. So there you will see development uh, in all the things that are being done on digital. So we cannot um, progress enough if we don't take into account and we don't work strongly enough in the interoperability aspects. And this has been confirmed by this uh, communication. But this 
there are other aspects and those are on the education and the skills and this is which we have the links on on the activities of the interoperability academy so as you can see um Sorry, <laughs> was too fast moving to the next uh, slide. Uh, I just wanted to confirm. So there, there are actions, uh, to digital education action plan and a reinforced skills agenda. Now um, we can move to the to the detailed your program. Um, so you may have uh, followed uh, yesterday. There was. Um, a new announcement of the multi-annual financial framework. So the the image you see here was the one that was presented um, uh, some time ago. This comes from the proposal from the Commission in 2018 on the multi-annual financial framework. Uh, yesterday, uh, the Commission uh, uh, reshaped a bit the proposal uh, to take into account the uh, impact of the crisis and uh, shifted a bit some of the priorities. But if you see uh, digital has not changed or has even increased its priority, uh, the digital your program um, um, keeps the same amount uh, of the proposed. And well, here you have highlighted uh, the advanced digital skills, which is a part of the DW program, but I would invite you also to look at uh, the communications that were done yesterday, where you can see that um, uh, the idea of digital skills um, throughout Europe, and this covers everybody in, in Europe, uh, all population are key and will be reinforced. So not only through the data your program but also with other programs and this has been reinforced in the proposal made by the commission yesterday now to make the link with uh, what we are doing uh, um, with the interoperability academy so uh, we, we thought it was important to to give this broader context because um, the aim of the interoperability academy is to contribute to all what I have just said before. Um, so this is something that is not isolated. And as uh, Victoria also pointed out, um, it covers many, many different um, um, services, institutions, uh, levels of government. So it's very important that we do it uh, well. Um, the main focus, is, as you can see in the slide, is uh, to have uh, e-learning resources on interoperability. The good thing is that we started this before the lockdown. I mean, like, yeah, quite some time ago already. But now this has uh, even increased <laughs> its importance on, on having e-learning resources um, um, in, in this uh, context. Um, we thought also that uh, it was important not just to give, you know, the, the resources out there and voila, whomever wants to take them or to, to teach them can, can use them, but it was to put, important to put them in a context and um, uh, propose some uh, learning paths which would help people to really benefit better from uh, these uh, e-learning resources which can also be complemented with other kind of uh, learning uh, possibilities and all for being done in a free online platform. And the idea is also, uh, as Victoria said, not to re reinvent the wheel. So whatever is already available, uh, it's available and we don't need to build again something that exists, but more focus on, on the gaps that exist and on um, reducing or improving what is already uh, available there. So, um, yeah. I, I hope that this helps also you to, to for the discussions that will come later to have this uh, wider view on uh, what's going on from a policy uh, perspective uh, and um, which are our ability. Okay. So thank you very much. And, and I, um, 
I think for part of this uh, webinar. Thanks a lot, Natalia, for, for sharing your uh, insight. I may not be able to say I wish you to discuss him. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Natalia, for, for sharing your insight on this uh, policy context. And as you said, yeah, the, the future is starting now, basically. So thanks a lot again. We will then uh, move to the to the next section of this webinar. So here we uh, we, we started this webinar by uh, mentioning synergies, collaboration, which is really important. And in that regard, uh, we wanted to 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 show you to 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 explain to you how we are together uh, working with the EU Academy, which is also a new initiative that is now. Uh, being executed and uh, and this is why we have definitely here a clear link between both uh, academies considering that the interoperability academy will be a part of the broader eu academy so we can uh, move to the next slide and in and, and to start uh, this section uh, we will have uh, the second project officer george lobo who will uh, give us give you some more uh, insights about it george if you want Hi. the floor is yours can you hear me well loud and clear yes okay that's perfect okay so uh, the things that i will just do an introduction because as uh, ludo mentioned that uh, interoperability academy will be part of the eu academy so you will have a presentation by the the business owner of the eu academy of what it is uh, we are part of the pilot so we were also on the the first uh, the first product, um, minimal viable product, will be a part of it. And uh, we will start, of course, by our, uh, uh, Miguel say it's the Bible, or Bible, which is the European Interoperability Framework. You have it mentioned quite a number of times here. And this is really also for us, it was, it's the first e-learning that we develop. We have a lot of material, as we may have seen on the catalog that has been published on JoinUp. We have uh, hundreds of resources, videos, uh, slides, etc. But this was really uh, the first e-learning course that we are uh, currently uh, finalizing. And it will be hosted on the EU Academy uh, platform. And I will now, I guess that was very short from my side. I will give the floor now to uh, Paul, I think. Or oh, there are other things that I... Uh, Ah, yeah, so maybe yeah, the, the, the plan. So now it's true that it's one of the objective as well of the of the, the thing. It's the last part. So first we are now uh, currently testing. So it's uh, currently happening functional testing and uh, testing also the different roles that exist on the platform. Um, normally end of uh, this month. So in uh, in, uh, in a few days, we will have the EIF course, so the, the first uh, test of the EIF course, and there will be testing of the courses before the release. And normally in June, um, we will have the minimal viable product released, and we will offer the EIF course live on the platform ready to use. And for this, we would really like to have people, and if you know, uh, to have tests. So, because this is, as we, we say, it's not something we do for the internal. It's not a corporate product we do for us. So it's for, and it's important uh, that we keep contact and that we have feedback from outside from what we are producing because uh, this is how we progress and we make sure that uh, what we are doing is useful and fit to, to purpose. So now I'll give you the floor to Paul and uh, I will uh, cut my camera and mic. Hello, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, just checking, you can hear me, yeah? It's okay? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So, um, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Paul Hearn. I'm Senior Expert in Knowledge Management at the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission, 20-plus uh, year veteran of the European Commission. Um, I just wanted to take you through a little bit the project for which I'm business owner at the moment, which is called the EU Academy Project. It's been mentioned many times already today. Um, just a kind of a little bit of uh, background, what are we trying to achieve with this project? Um, uh, we're trying to actually consolidate the, uh, the e-learning um, activities of many uh, 
uh, commission services, but also uh, in EU institutions. Uh, you may know, for example, that when we started, there were 12 uh, learning management systems in operation that we could count and uh, another seven just about to launch, uh, costing probably upwards of about 12 or 12, 13 million euros a year to just to run uh, with the servers and things. So we basically decided to consolidate all of that into a single platform uh, and bring everybody into a single place where they could find uh, very, very authoritative um, e-learning materials that are offered by all the EU institutions together. Uh, and uh, this has been a beautiful project. It's been an amazing uh, project I've been working on for about a year now. And we're very proud that we're just about to uh, go live with it, um, as George and others said earlier. So what is it? It's basically, of course, it's GDPR compliant. It's a world-class inter-institutional online learning platform delivering targeted high-quality learning to external professionals and aspiring professionals yeah, who work at the interface between EU policy and its implementation. So a couple of words really important there. Of course, it's focused on the external world. We do have our own internal e-learning platform called EU Learn. It's not that. It's, um, it's for the external world. And it's focused exclusively on uh, everything related to EU policy and its implementation. And we're working at the moment with, I think it, at the last count, it was eight um, services, uh, seven commission services and another EU institution. Um, and we're bringing a lot of content uh, online for October. The first thing that's going to be live is going to be, of course, the content that's sure shared from the Interoperability Academy, which is just a few weeks away. But we're working very hard in the background uh, to produce another about 15 courses in total uh, that will be going live in, in, in October. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so yeah, just a couple of these words then. I mean, what we really realize is that, of course, you know, the things to take the takeaway is that this is an inter-institutional project. It's very ambitious in that sense. It's a synergies and efficiencies project, as I mentioned about the cost savings, but it's also a silo busting project. So we want to go out there to European professionals and citizens with a topic based um, a platform, not a kind of an institution based platform, uh, because we believe that European citizens and professionals don't really care about the internal structure to so much of our organization, but care about the, the, the topics themselves and the content themselves. So, so this is the this is the, the proposal here. We're working, you know, only to accept content, of course, of the highest possible quality. We have a quality charter. Um, and, you know, we're working with, uh, as I mentioned, th these 15 courses at the moment, they involve all sorts of amazing use cases, uh, one involving 500,000 teachers and people working at schools, uh, another involving um, 9,000 cities around the world on air quality, um, different things, and also your amazing work um, on your interoperability work too, involving European public sector uh, officials. Yeah, next slide. Uh, yeah, so just uh, just to recap what um, what George said earlier as well, uh, you know, this is where we are, the little yellow ring there. We're at uh, MVP stage, minimum viable product. So we certainly have something that people will be able to see within, you know, a couple of weeks now. Uh, and uh, we're actually targeting a, a full release uh, with a little bit more functionality uh, uh, around about the fourth quarter, probably not December, probably slightly before, but in the fourth quarter of this year. And we have a, then we go through subsequent good release cycles and improve as we go along. And you know, I think one takeaway, uh, I think I believe this is uh, this is my last slide. So one takeaway is that you know this is this is going to be a world class platform. So we're really going to push the boat on on technology here and on look and feel. Uh, we want AI, we want uh, virtual reality, we want all sorts of things happening on this platform. Uh, just to show the modern face of the of the European institutions uh, and and also and also the the amazing content and, and services that we can provide to uh, to professionals and citizens. Yeah. So that's this is the EU Academy project in a nutshell. I'm very happy to take any questions uh, you may have related to it. Thank you very much. Thank thank you, Paul. Uh, so I believe that yeah, for the participant, it was uh, re gives a really good overview. Let's say. Uh, of the EU Academy and also uh, how the Interoperability Academy will fit into it. Um, mm -hmm. And we wanted to, to stop here for a couple of minutes just to ask for, for, for your feedback. So we have here basically a 
two main questions where we would like uh, to get your opinion. So do not hesitate to unmute your microphone and uh, give you your view. First of all, on what is the highest potential that the EU Academy can reach with this partnership with the EU Academy? So if anyone has some uh, comment, I see also that there were some uh, discussion on the chat, but yeah, please do not hesitate. Uh, to raise your voice here. So this can, of course, answer can also be based on your uh, on your experience. I see that uh, Vicky Margariti raised her hand. So Vicky, of course, do not hesitate to unmute your microphone and uh, give you your view on this uh, on this question. No, okay. Is there anyone else who who would like who hasn't would like to to express his opinion on the on really the potential that this IOP Academy within the EU Academy will have? Okay, so. We can see yep. also on the chat uh, Dimitris Panopoulos made a comment as well. And there's a hand hand raised, I think. And Telis Nicolaitis and one other raise the hand so mm -hmm. but but i really propose that you you just un unmute your microphone um yeah just instead of raising your your hand you are really free to to comment and to answer on this uh, question and on the next ones huh? so if people who raise their hand please feel free to just unmute hello hello yeah Uh, yes, we hear you. Uh, uh, could, could, could you, I, Nicolas, again? Uh, I would like to know to ask you uh, in collaboration in terms of uh, multilingualism. And, uh, uh, of course, it's uh, one of uh, our intentions is to provide more digital uh, skills uh, academy um, uh, in Greek. In Instead of, of uh, perhaps in English, you have a collaboration with you in the to have your uh, 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 your courses uh, in order to be divided in uh, locally. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, yeah, the, the quality was not that good, but from what I understand, uh, I believe that here you were asking about uh, how to tackle uh, multilingualism, considering that in your initiative, basically most of the content is in Greek language, and um, and so to 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 understand if there are anyway here synergies that can be found in terms of translation, is that uh, correct? Yeah. Can I ask? Yeah, maybe also because I I thought I understood, but maybe you can yes, yes. That's correct right. that uh, if you want right. that the possibility to right. deploy the courses locally as well. That was you wanted to know. Yeah, that's right. Yes. So I mean, maybe our plan is that everything that is produced in Isa Square normally is available uh, free of charge. The the courses themselves. We want to use uh, an open license, so uh, I suppose because since the GRC recommends for uh, to CC by CC by for uh, as the default uh, for use the default um, the default language we will use uh, the default uh, licensing, uh, and we're planning normally the SCORM packages, so it will be on Moodle. The SCORM packages should be also downloadable and reusable. So this is why we are uh, sticking uh, for the Interoperability Academy to be interoperable, so meaning to use an open standard that could be reused in other platforms. So you will be able to have the package and uh, to modify it and to translate it, uh, of course, and uh, to do uh, what you want. So the package after that can also be deployed on any compliant uh, Scrum platform as well. That's the plan. OK, maybe, maybe, sure, thank you. I maybe just come in here. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that we're currently working with a customer 
on a on a series of courses with, that are translated already into I think it's twenty nine, uh, maybe it's thirty one languages. I think so. Uh, you know, that, so in terms of the, the content itself, if it's available in those languages, that's fine. You know, of course, the, there is a there is a cost to to producing a multilingual content. Of course, we all know that. But if the content is available in that in that um, language and suitable for publishing on the EU Academy, we'd certainly be very happy to publish it. Also, just another thing to bear in mind is that the the platform itself is fully multilingual too. So the user can select uh, whichever language via the interface as as they wish, right? So so there is a kind of uh, there is a, 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 a pre thought about the. Um, about the multilinguality issue for sure and on the point of uh, of open licensing yeah that's indeed the case i mean we believe that you know what is produced with uh, with european uh, money should be available right um uh, for free free use um it may not be the case for all courses on the platform there may be other reasons that we can't do that but uh, for confidentiality or sensitivity or whatever but but um uh, and they might be for restricted audiences but for the for the rest uh, it, that's certainly our intention Okay, let's uh, okay. take him uh, Yeah, please. Uh, that's good to know because I think that um, uh, one of the most important aspects, if you want to try pilots in, in other countries as well, considering that you, you want to make the material available also under the Creative Commons uh, framework, mm -hmm. which is, in my opinion, well done, I think. Uh, so the questions raised by, by the colleagues is that um, you have at some points issues with uh, with the language, so. But the way you deploy the material, it's probably easy, subtitable or translatable. So I think um, multilingualism should be per se be something in any website or any academy in Europe at this point. Regarding the badges now, it's a different thing. Badges, uh, especially in the Interoperability Academy, could act as a kind of incentive for the persons to, to hold the classes. But you have to devise, uh, let's say, a recognizable badges scheme, which is accepted, let's say, by the market, by the people, by the institutions. Mm -hmm. But it's a very good incentive for people to, to, to take the classes and, and take exams, for example, to, to get a, some sort of certification by the way. So I think it's an important aspect we should consider looking into very soon. Yeah, I, I, do, I, I, I do agree with you that uh, this is a great opportunity. And it just shows you, for me, it shows the, the beauty of bringing these different platforms together. Um, because everybody was dealing with this in a little in in, on, in their own way or, or not at all, and, uh, and and we can actually by 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 creating a critical mass here, we can actually you know propose uh, some kind of solution for this. It was certainly something that we we would like to look at in our second phase uh, after we get through our MVP. We certainly want to look at the issue of digital badges and and certification and things like this. Yeah, and and maybe interoperability with. Some other EU tools like Europass and things like this. So this is something certainly on our radar for the future, and it's a great it's a great thought to hold, keep in mind. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, certification sounds a little bit heavy, you know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's an easy if if you make it an easy recognizable brand, it's going to be a success. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. But that, that's really yeah, our idea, as uh, as Paul mentioned, basically. So of course, here we are starting with a with the MVP, so minimal uh, viable product. But of course, as part of our requirement for the next uh, releases, there is really this aspect that is already considered about badges and also about um, to make it easy to link it also to to social media, for example. Because as you say, this is definitely an incentive. So usually, and we see even more and more, um, at least on my side, on my LinkedIn. For example, I see that during this lockdown period, there are more and more people who took some certification, and of course, they are eager to share it uh, on their uh, social media and LinkedIn, for example. So, so definitely, this is already under uh, consideration. So that will uh, that will happen, basically. Uh, also, raised, just another yeah. raised hand, I think, uh, PN. Oh, is that already? 
I think that to come back just to the multilingualism, uh, so Cecile just put also a comment on the chat just to be sure that everyone uh, saw it. So Cecile mentioned that the structural reform funds can also be requested uh, to translate content, so to translate the wow. material. So okay. that's another that's other option, let's say, to be to be investigated. But of course, when we were talking about synergies, a translation of material is part of it. So of course, our courses will be firstly developed uh, in English, but mm -hmm. definitely uh, when we go more uh, local, let's say, uh, at national level, it definitely makes sense, you know, to have, for example, this EIF uh, course, that will be the first one, to have it also translated, for example, in Greek, if we want to share it with the, with the with a lot of Greek civil servants. So, so definitely on that, there are, there are some uh, synergies that should be established. So we will get back to you on this. Right. Okay, so I think we, we also started basically to, to answer to the second question, but I would still would like to spend just two or three minutes if anyone else uh, has also comment. So our idea here, and you already mentioned badges and multilingualism, but our idea with the second question was to understand from you and also from your experience uh, to understand what would you consider as really important feature to have in the IOP Academy? So is there anyone else who would like to, yes. to give his opinion? Please. Uh, yeah, can I say a few things? Um, sure. I think uh, since interoperability is a very broad term, we have been saying that before, um, and enters a lot of different disciplines, uh, some effort has to be spent into structuring the content in different uh, categories or streams or hierarchies, uh, maybe levels also, because um, and also in parallel um, doing something which is called anchoring. Anchoring means relating the content to other disciplines. For example, you will have someone entering the academy coming from a technical background. So. Um, we have to make the content, the various subjects, formed and structured in different ways so that um, everyone will understand uh, what is the, the cause and what is the target for every uh, little module. Because from what I've seen up to now in the uh, table of contents, um, it's a very diverse uh, list of subjects. Mm -hmm. So some effort has to be spent in structuring that uh, according to interoperability terms, let's say organizational issues, semantic issues and the short, but also according to uh, other disciplines like computer science, like uh, management science, because this material will target a lot of uh, issues. And also think about um, the goal, meaning there is a, a, a public servant that will enter the academy, so he has to see himself somehow there and his goals. There is a consultant from, um, uh, from an industry, from a company that wants to see himself. So it's not so easy uh, to do this because there are various opinions and various views on that, but there is literature on how to structure interoperability courses or interoperability subjects into several hierarchies. Yeah, this is certainly something that once we get beyond our, our first um, MVP, we're going to address uh, with um, with uh, the I squared program uh, and try to find an arrangement there. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, our, our goal is to make sure that people find what they're looking for, right? When they come to the platform, that's for sure. Hi, Lena. Uh, okay. If I may, if I may. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So Dimitrios Pikios here from ESCO. I think on this very, very important uh, issue, um, the usage of ESCO further down the road uh, in the Interoperability Academy uh, project uh, will help because this is exactly what uh, ESCO does. It uh, links different it links skills to different occupations and sectors, but also across occupations and sectors in a different kind of structure. Uh, which I will briefly show uh, later during my presentation. So I think uh, mm. on this issue of um, 
uh, allowing people to understand what they need to uh, get a training on and what this training, any training uh, on the platform will uh, uh, is is important for or relevant to. I think this uh, will be uh, really enabled by by ESCO. Thank you. Yeah, we we do already have contacts actually um, with your with your your team, and uh, we're really looking forward to getting that started uh, once we get beyond this first prototype stage. Absolutely, it's a great opportunity actually. Yeah, sorry, I cut something. Uh, Noragonescu here from the academy too. I would like to add something related to, to learning path because uh, what comes up in what, what I hear is that of course there is a there is a big need to access the relevant information on the relevant level and uh, and structure it in various ways and it's going to be so much content not only part of the interact uh, interoperability academy, but also generally uh, on the on, on the EU academy, um, and so one of the one of the biggest levers that we want to give our uh, our clients and different levels of users is to create various learning paths uh, with the with the content that uh, that is there, which is relevant to their individual users. Then, right? So. So the, the, the content can be structured in various ways, can be accessed in various ways, because it's probably sometimes on the level of a user in a, in a, in a country or a certain academic, uh, academic user who will say, okay, our people need this learning path, this is the level, and so, both uh, both intermediate organizations and 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 individual learners can build their own learning paths, and I think this is one of the uh, more exciting uh, features that we want to work on. Is what I want to add. Thank you, Nora. So we still have time for one uh, last answer. So do we have one more participant who would like to express in view? on really the most important features that you would like to see on the Interoperability Academy? If, if not, we can definitely move if that. I, to if the I next may one. repeat yes, maybe, uh, that we, we have published, uh, as you know, the, the learning path, maybe to remind that we have the learning path and different profiles. So there are still time also to, to comment on the materials we have. So. Uh, and I think what uh, Professor Yanis Kalarabidis say that it's very, I mean, we are considering this type of different uh, difficulties, etc., and to have different learning paths according to profiles. So this is something we are taking into account, and this is why also we would need your um, your uh, feedback on uh, how to, to link this. And as well, I mean, as uh, it will be presented as uh, later by Barry as well, you will see that uh, there have been a lot of work done on that and also taking standards because, I mean, as I say, I will repeat it again, <laughs> interoperability is very important. So for us, it's important that we, uh, if we use, for example, a schema for, uh, I mean, uh, ESCO, for example, that is, it can be also reused and it, it talks to 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 other countries and it's, uh, it can be reused by others and there is a, a I mean, recognize the open standard that uh, characterize also this uh, this type of uh, skills and competence maybe just one last comment comment from me on the EU academy side so uh, just to come back to the, the the project itself i mean we we're gaining a lot of momentum there's a lot of enthusiasm i think this is seen as uh, a quite a new a new type of project for the institutions and uh, we're really excited about it and we're really looking forward to making it what you want it to be <laughs> And having you as part of it, right? So uh, you'll certainly be hearing from us uh, going forward, and uh, and we hope to share some great news and some great um, experiences with you in the future. Yeah, just a comment, sorry, Lud, on my side as well. I'm Victoria. Um, I saw in the chat the question from Dimitris Spanopoulos. So in the future, if we want to collaborate with other platforms such as Coursera or EDX. I'll let Paul uh, reply to this. Uh, it's too early, but maybe we can have a view. 
Yeah, I don't have a I don't have a clear view on it right now. I would say um, I think you know yes to explore for sure. Um, I don't know what the what the solution of that exploration will be today. Um, but yeah. Okay. So probably also to mention that my colleague Katarina just shared again on the chat a link where you can access all the work that has been done by our team on the learner profiles and the learning path. So of course, uh, this is available on the join up platform and there is the possibility to comment. So if you if you could spend still a couple of minutes to go through it and commenting, it will be of course more than appreciated. So let's then move now to the next uh, to the next section because we started already to talk about this first course. We talk about the Bible uh, that EIF is, but now uh, the idea of this section will be to give you already some more uh, some more insights and inputs on what has been done and what you can expect from this first course on the European Interoperability Framework, the EIF. So this is my pleasure to introduce uh, Miguel who is a program manager within the interoperability unit of DigiDigits uh, and who will present to us now what has been done in the last months and what can be expected in the coming days. Miguel, the, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you, Miguel. Can you hear me now? Ludovic. Now we can, yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm back. I would like to present now, as Ludovic said, um, our experience implementing first training module um, as part of the Interoperability Academy. In our case, it's been a very rewarding experience because we are learning indeed um, how to convert, let's say, more uh, paper-based uh, training modules, uh, documentation that is on paper, into something more uh, towards e-learning. So with the collaboration of different people that, uh, that I will mention later on, we are learning indeed a lot. So for us, this initial collaboration with the Interoperability Academy is by itself a learning path, how to create a online learning courses. The starting point for us is the European Interoperability Framework. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it's our Bible, but Indeed, is the main framework conceptualizing the interoperability requirements, the interoperability uh, principles that later on are crystallizing in a series of solutions implemented as part of the ISO Square program. The EIF a framework is quite comprehensive. It's part of a new communication back from 2017. The framework was in 2017 and now provides more clear guidance on the establishment of interoperable digit interoperable digital public services. So the framework is composed of different uh, different modules, different parts that are taken into account in the in the creation of the online learning modules. And basically to summarize, we have a conceptual model. We have four levels of interoperability plus two extra levels, 12 principles and, four, and 47 recommendations. So the starting point is that in the national interoperability framework project, uh, of ISA Square. This is a, an observatory where we do on a regular basis the monitoring of the level of implementation of the European interoperability, interoperability framework across the European member states. We decided two years ago to create uh, learning modules to raise awareness on the EIF among our, let's say, community of practitioners and stakeholders. These modules were created in PowerPoint. Uh, following also a kind of um, a structured approach, uh, starting uh, for the basic introduction on the main concepts, jumping later on in something more for practitioners, digging in into the technicalities and the, main, the more detailed elements of the framework. And this approach, dividing, uh, structuring the training modules in PPT, in PowerPoint, in different modules already, depending on the level of advancement of the level of understanding of the EIF help us later on to transform these static modules in something more dynamic, more uh, oriented, more appropriate for so in the next slide. Yeah, thank you. 
when we were approached by the colleagues uh, of the Interoperability Academy to, to crystallize this idea, we immediately detected that we had the training modules in point, but we didn't have really a, a clear platform, a, a clear academic community, you know, to visualize, to display these training modules. So from the very beginning, it was a win-win situation. We had already some material, but we didn't have the channel, nor the means, you know, to reach out to a wider uh, audience of practitioners, uh, academics, uh, policymakers, uh, and developers and business owners, let's say. So working with to create already some kind of mindset on how the models should target different profiles. Different profiles, again, I would say in our case are policymakers, first of all. Then we have uh, academic, academia, uh, developers and business owners, people that will be hand on uh, implementing digital services. The target audience in principle will be used to promote the three main pillars of the EIF. The principles, the layers, and the and the conceptual model. And to learn how interoperability design a practical case. What we was missing in the PowerPoint version was a practical case. We detected that for an e-learning uh, environment uh, where uh, the students will be confronted uh, to a more dynamic uh, situation, it's not also important to convey the main theoretical principles, but, but to provide a practical case and also to to implement some uh, checkpoints to under, to see to figure out whether the students are getting the main concepts. And this is going to give us feedback in the future as well to see some weaknesses in the training modules and how we can improve and revamp the material. As it is now, because we are finalizing the implementation of these uh, online modules, uh, what we are in implementing is basically two main components. The online learning course itself that will deliver indeed knowledge, the key concepts, and practical skills, for instance, through this practical case. And then attached to these learning courses, there will be an interactive so that any time they, they can just jump in in and get access to all the documentation and all the content of the EIF to dig in and to maybe find out more detailed information. The training module is not meant to, to provide the whole set of information. It's, to, it's, it's just to provide some basic concepts uh, to create some uh, learning paths. But the, the whole documentation will always be accessible for the students to, to get a, a deeper knowledge. The structure of the modules that were agreed with the Interoperability Academy are with a external provider that has a, a lot of experience in creating online training modules. And for me, this is already lessons learned. Don't do it in isolation. Try to reach out to some competent people, to some experts on the topic. Uh, it's composed of six modules. The duration uh, is 50 minutes. And the mo each module includes uh, the video animation the, uh, that is seven, eight minutes presenting the main concepts, the PowerPoint presentations that always are, are always ac accessible. But here the concept is different. It's the, the main concepts are displayed through any video animations to engage the audience, to make it um, catcher, let's say. And at the end of each uh, module, there is a quiz. It's the checkpoint that I mentioned any, any long with a multiple choice questions where the student can challenge themselves and they can see if they have learned the basic concepts. So we as the content providers we decided what are the main concepts that the students should learn after each module. And based on this, we created this kind of multiple choice questions. So in the next slide, please. Here you, we can see the six modules. So the first module is the overview. What is the EIF, the European Interoperability Framework, and what are the key concepts? So in a way, this is very sequential, starting from the baseline for beginners, jumping into more complex modules, 
where people with this level acquire before will be capable of facing a more deeper uh, learning path to understand much better, more complex topics. So it's a kind of a progressive and an early learning path, starting from beginners, jumping into practitioners. The second part is to present already the main areas of the framework. The first one, the underlying principles. The third module is the interoperability ledgers. And the fourth module, conceptual module. So basically, you know, uh, following modules one, two, three, and four, they will have already an excellent understanding on what is at stake when implementing the framework, what you need to keep in mind and what what kind of should be valid for you in order to implement interoperable digital services. After each module, there is a checkpoint, this quiz. And module five is, is let's say, complementary, since at the end of the day, we are heading, we are also aiming to to present these modules to, sorry to, to engage let's say the policy makers and the business owners uh, in different public administrations in europe uh, we want also to explain to them how the eif can be monitored by us because it's one of the mandates that we got from this communication back in 2017 so we explain also to policy makers mainly how we are doing this monitoring mechanism the, the composite the kpis the dashboards that we have created. And finally, the summary is the EIF implementation practical case. In collaboration, for instance, with my colleague Cecile, that was, uh, introduced herself at the beginning, uh, we figured out a, a practical uh, use case, a, a, a real situation where a policymaker or a business owner from any public administration could be confronted, and is the creation of a new public service that is going to be offered online digitally and where you need to take into account different administrations. There must be a data exchange and the integration of different IT systems uh, that are in hands of different competent authorities, meaning that in order to put in place this new system, you need to apply all the concepts that are depicted in the framework. You need to have a proper governance, but you also need to work at the semantic level, at the legal level, level certainly, at the organizational level and at the technical level. So in this practical case, you can understand how this theoretical stuff that you learned earlier on in practice could work in a real life situation. And um, basically that was the, this is more or less the path that we have undergone. Here you have, we can see already some screech, uh, screenshots on how, how this is, is going to look like in the platform of the interoperability academy is going to be very visual in this case we can see principle one as part of this generic module on the 12 principles of the framework and we can see that from a very visual way it, um, you can learn what is this uh, principle about and also intuitively the, in a very intuitive way because of these um, animations probably the concepts will be grasped in a much better way than in the traditional methods based on a paper-based uh, documentation or a PowerPoint. And finally, the last slide I wanted to present to you is um, a, another module, uh, and it's about the four layers. And here we can see the concept of legal interoperability, indeed how can be displayed uh, using a particular example. In this case, we have a situation where two countries they need to collaborate together, France and Poland, and with a practical example, you can also um, understand much better these principles. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Miguel, for giving us this insight about how the the first course on the Interreligious Academy will look like. Um, so basically here now it will be a second round uh, of question and answer. So the same principle as before, uh, we really encourage you just to, to unmute your microphone and answer uh, straight away to, the, to this question. And starting with the first one, so in your, in your own organization, uh, we wanted to know whether do you already have courses uh, linked to interoperability or advanced uh, digital skills. 
So on the chat, we got already some inputs from uh, Vicky Margariti, who now uh, left, but that's what she was mentioning that they have. But we wanted to know also from the other participant, because it's again in this idea of not reinventing the wheel and reusing uh, already existing content. So when we talk about interoperability or even advanced digital skills, do you have anything that you believe um, that could be shared, let's say, between uh, both academies? Uh, yes, uh, Ludovic, this is Yanis again. Yeah, yeah, please, Yanis. Uh, yes, uh, what we've been doing in, uh, in my university is um, we have um, at least um, one lesson in the pre-graduate that mm -hmm. uh, we have two lessons in the pre-graduate. One of them is more devoted to, to, to interoperability issues, and the other is more in the context of uh, digital governance. So it adds uh, also other things about uh, government 2.0 and evidence-based decision making and simulation and the sort. But interoperability is a good part. Um, so in this uh, context, let's say we explain to them the basics of what is interoperability in various uh, terms, of course, and in various contexts. And then uh, we give a, a good overview of AIF, um, European Interoperability Framework, and of course, some of the tools behind it for the pre-graduate. Now, for the postgraduate, we have a, a postgraduate, uh, a master in digital governance. So there um, we give uh, a full lesson that is um, 13 lectures. Uh, on interoperability, and um, we do the AIF, of course. We have translated everything in Greek because um, AIF is, is provided in Greek from European Commission at the basic, of course, the, the usual document. But then we have developed a lot of material on top. And um, so this is a full, um, a full presentation of AIF, then a full presentation of AIRA, the Interoperability Reference Architecture, and um, also IMAPS, previously IMM, if I remember correctly. Um, what else? And of, of course, we also give a good view of the Greek, of the national interoperability framework, which is, as you expect, much more detailed and practical because AIF is the guideline for the national interoperability frameworks. Um, what else? Another thing we do is that um, um, we, we um, give also some uh, lectures um, on a continuing uh, education program uh, that is not under, let's say, an academic, uh, you know, uh, curriculum, either pre-graduate or postgraduate. So usually we deliver that to companies or to public administrations. And there we have a lot more issues, as I saw also in the academy, about um, things relating uh, to technical issues, things relating to legal also uh, frameworks. So yeah, there is there, there is some experience and some material. Okay, but well, that's really good to hear, Yanis. And yeah, I uh, as that... I say, um, but maybe this is another uh, answer. So I just leave it here because you have a different question then for something I want to say. So. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. But definitely, I think the, the, we have already almost an answer to the last question from your side. So would you be interested to explore synergies between our initiative and exchange expertise? Definitely, I, I understood from what you said that the answer could be yes. And in that regard, we will uh, definitely follow up with, uh, with you after this webinar to see more in practice how we can make it happen, basically. Thanks a lot, yes. Yanis. Yes, uh, I, have offered, I have offered my team uh, so that when you progress, of course, with Interoperability Academy a little bit. So after summer, we are uh, we have been uh, discussing to uh, start organizing a lesson that is for 2021 um, based completely or somehow more strongly on the Interoperability Academy so that you have also a, uh, a test in an academic environment. And then we we take it forward. So if everything goes fine, we are uh, available from uh, September onwards, let's say, to work on that. And uh, another thing that uh, we are also willing to do is um, to have a test somehow of what we are going to do here. Uh, we have the summer school in July in uh, Samos. So we have a pretty good amount of students there. 
at pre-graduate and mostly post-graduate level, we could test some of the concepts. So we are open to uh, discuss that. So I, I answered everything. I don't speak again. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot, Yanis. That's really appreciated. Do, do we have, and again, uh, we were talking right from the beginning about synergies. Here's a really good uh, example. Do, do we have anyone else who, who believes that uh, content uh, created within their organization may be good uh, to be shared with our academy? Uh, yes. Can I speak now? Uh, yes, sure. Yes, it's Pastor again, Nicolaides again. Uh, yesterday, I had a, I had a discussion with the general secretary of uh, uh, Quiti, and uh, she interesting in, uh, based on your uh, work uh, have uh, synergies uh, uh, provide to to re to regional structures. Uh, of general secretary uh, dedicated or more uh, focused to gender dimension uh, uh, courses. Uh, the same could be applied to other initiatives uh, uh, and we have a regional dimension and we think uh, based on your uh, experience and uh, your courses uh, to uh, have slight modifications and to enhance the regional dimension, probably uh, uh, having uh, more uh, uh, tests on our uh, region or to to uh, perhaps uh, co-creation, uh, 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 some uh, courses uh, with you. We are very interested in this. Okay, so yeah, I think by, by default, definitely, of course, the, the, the courses that will be provided in the IOP Academy should be applicable uh, to all uh, levels, I would say. So national, regional, local levels, of course. But definitely, if you, we see here that there is a specific need um, on, on your hand to, to, to really have a focus on regional level with some use cases, for example, of this kind of things, definitely we can envisage to have some uh, co-creation uh, in order to put some uh, some more highlights, let's say, uh, on this regional aspect. Yep. So on that, we will also need to to follow up with you to exactly uh, see what uh, what uh, what can be done Thank in you that very regard. Much. Thanks to you. And anyone else who would like to promote uh, some content? Okay, so probably we can then, um, yeah, looking at the clock. Okay, we can definitely then move to the next uh, question. And no, 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 let's go back to the next question. Yeah, so, and, and the next question was in the context of your strategic objective to understand what courses would you like to see on the Interoperability Academy? Because here, so of course, uh, I think Miguel gave us a really good teaser about uh, the, the first course that will be on the European Interoperability Framework. However, now we are exactly uh, at a time uh, selecting uh, what, what will be the next uh, courses that should become available as e-learning modules. So of course here, this webinar is uh, really at the right timing in order to understand from you what would be, uh, let's say, topic of interest, what could help uh, you or people in your organization um, to, to to get better skills, let's say, on interoperability or advanced digital skills. Is is there anything in particular that you would like to highlight? Could be definitely courses that for the moment you didn't find really, uh, where we, you didn't find online resources. Is there anything that is uh, coming to your mind? Not, not much answers on this one. No one, no one for this question.
Okay, so then we will uh, we will move uh, to the next one. Of course, this is uh, a webinar. We cannot always expect uh, direct answers, but you know, as I explained, that we are definitely in this uh, in this moment uh, just selecting and uh, planning what will be the next courses for the for the coming months. So, of course, if anything uh, pops up uh, on your on your side. Uh, do not hesitate to let us know. You you will see at the end of this webinar, we will give you all the communication channels that you can use. So, of course, even if not now, do not hesitate in uh, the future. Um, okay, and the last question, but basically here, that I think that's already good because we got kind of uh, informally, let's say, answer to this question, but it was about your interest to explore synergies uh, between our initiative and exchange expertise. So we were talking about co-creation, for example, to give a more a regional dimension, um, or also uh, testing, and this is what was already answered by Yanis, uh, mentioning the summer school that will happen in Samos, and where there, there may be a good a critical mass of people uh, that may um, that may test and provide us with feedback about this, uh, about this first module that will be available at that time. Um, anyone else would like to to raise? Yeah. Ludo? Sorry, I'm Victoria. Uh, just before uh, continuing and uh, to say that, okay, this is just a webinar. We wanted to briefly present what we are up to now and possible synergies and collaborations, so not repeat and do again what others have done. But also we have everything public on Join Up and also on the ISA webpage, the action is really described there. So we have everything public and you can comment and also you can contact us for further collaboration because this is just the start. This is just the first module, the AIF, but also we have others in the row and also on our roadmap that you will see and also we presented in our first webinar. So we will also be there to comment and also follow up later as well, not only on this webinar. Thank you. Yep. Um, Ludovic, if you allow a small comment, since nobody else is, is taking the floor on that, on the uh, question number two, the context and the courses, if everything mm -hmm. is fine. Uh, look, OK, I will not answer everything now. Um, and to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I haven't spent so much time in the um, in the website of the interoperability academy i'm trying to to keep up now so uh, in the meantime i saw a lot of work being done on the streams and the profiles and things but um, speaking about the courses uh, i'm right now at the at the table of contents for example i look at semantic interoperability okay there is a semic um, a semic um, a presentation from 2016 there is a semantic interoperability for presentation powers and mandates from 2016 and a public multilingual knowledge management infrastructure, blah, 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 2016. OK, if we want to cover semantic interoperability at a certain depth, uh, I think uh, there is a lot to be added here, both at theoretical level, but also at practical, because we are working now with catalogs, we're working with um, uh, service directory, service catalogs, there is the CPSV AP, uh, meaning I'm not sure if I look at the correct place. I'm looking at the place which is the catalog of educational resources. So answering to this question briefly, uh, I just say I have to say a lot. I will not do it now. Maybe I do when you say it's ready, I do a full screening and I give you a written report on things like that. But I wouldn't like to, to leave it go like everything is fine. We need to do things here, both at theoretical, some, of course, not too theoretical, but some theoretical background and also uh, most updated content, meaning, um, uh, you know, the content has to be like at most the two years ago, not more. I mean, this year's and 2019, because everything progresses very fast in these domains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pr probably because this was really a big part of the previous webinar, so we didn't put really emphasis on explaining again what the, this catalog is. But definitely here, the idea is that what we did, we we uh, research and we summarize all the material that is already available. 
However, so this uh, this is now uh, finalized, let's say, and here now what we are um, what we are doing at the moment is really to to see which of this material can be reused, but also to identify gaps. So meaning uh, topics uh, for which there is no material available and where there will be a need to really create uh, from scratch. So so of course, don't yeah, this catalog is really just. Uh, Let's say I would say state of the art. So this is what has been produced so far by the ISA and ISA Square program. But of course, it doesn't mean that uh, it is exhaustive. That's really part of our exercise at the moment to see what may be uh, the gap that needs to be filled in. And this is why we were asking also about topic that may be of your your interest that you would like to see on the on the academy. But of course, feedback about uh, about this catalog and about what is missing is really appreciated. We put again in the chat uh, the link to it. So do not hesitate to comment uh, with with your with your ideas, basically. May I intervene in this point? Uh, I'm Pavlina Fragu from uh, CEMIC. I would like uh, to answer uh, uh, to Professor uh, Harald Labidis uh, that uh, an effort uh, started uh, to update uh, um, uh, material that uh, concerns uh, semantic uh, interoperability in order uh, uh, to um, be incorporated in the interoperability academy. I must confess that it's an, uh, the whole um, um, effort started uh, quite uh, recently, so uh, we totally agree uh, the, uh, on the fact uh, that uh, um, um, the information uh, presented about uh, semantic imperability may seem to be uh, out of date, but uh, um, it, is, um, uh, it is in our intention to update it. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want to sound critical. Eh? I'm I'm also on your side, and I want to to work and to make it better. And it's not only about <laughs> semantic interoperability. For example, I see later down in ISA um, uh, point number nine, it says interoperability maturity model IMM, and it's also uh, you know all these all these publications and and I understand it's it's made now uh, as a as a as a placeholder. But uh, you know they come from uh, 2015 and even even uh, back as I see. I just uh, you know look very briefly right now. But if you want, I say, and when you are ready, let's say, uh, I would suggest that you make a call for action to give you a, a written review. That is, you know, it will stay. We will give you ideas, uh, solutions, maybe to some issues to correct here and there. When you are in a better stage, it's better that you call for some review, let's say, from some uh, of the team here or of your uh, other contacts to have a proper uh, written review on this. I would be glad to do it. Thank you so much for uh, the offer. It's something that uh, we appreciate yeah. and uh, uh, we uh, always open in uh, uh, being uh, in receiving uh, feedback uh, from uh, um, uh, important uh, stakeholders so that uh, we uh, um, appreciate uh, your offer. Really good. Let's. Uh, I propose that in order to finish on time, I propose to move then uh, to the next uh, section and yeah so so basically we already until now uh, we already had a briefing about the previous webinar we also got uh, from natalia all insight on the policy context we saw the link between eu academy and our interoperability academy uh, there was this presentation about uh, the eif the first courses and uh, basically now what we propose because it's again, it's uh, another synergy that we that we are uh, that we initiated, and this is basically with ESCO, so the European Skills, Competence, Qualification, and Occupation Framework. And in that regard, I will have my colleague uh, Barry, who will start uh, explaining the link that we have uh, between uh, between ESCO and our Interoperability Academy. And then it will be Dimitrios Picos, who is in charge of uh, the ESCO team, that will give you some more uh, some more insight uh, about ESCO. So, if you want, Barry, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ludo. Uh, my name is Barry Kruger. Um, I'm the e-learning advisor for Trisys working on Interoperability Academy. Uh, what I'll do is just spend a few minutes providing an introduction to the work uh, that we've been doing so far on mapping occupational skills and competencies 
uh, before passing to, to Midras, who will speak a little bit more about the specifics um, of ESCO. Uh, so essentially, uh, as you'll see at the top here, one of the core aims um, of the Interoperability Academy is to offer courses which will support development of relevant advanced digital skills in the public sector. Uh, more specifically, of course, uh, trying to create an interoperable, interoperable uh, public sector uh, through various interoperability initiatives. Um, and of course, what that has revealed to us is that we have a potentially, in fact, not a potentially, we have actually a uh, very uh, large and diverse set of potential learners. Um, so one of the challenges that we've had is trying to understand how these users from different national contexts uh, will approach this and what their particular needs are. Uh, a second challenge we faced relates to what Professor Yanis was speaking about earlier, was, uh, and that relates to the fact that we also need to think about providing some sort of structure uh, to the courseware that we will be offering as well. Um, so at, 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 at the moment, um, as you've heard Paul and others say, we're at the point where we'll be launching an MVP very soon. Uh, largely what the offer will be will be topic based. So we will have a few courses which are based on uh, topics which have been deemed to be of a priority, uh, which is fine. Uh, but we, what we need to move to is a more structured offering uh, in the medium term. OK, um, and what that structure is, we're thinking about now. It could be curriculum, it could be a competency framework. So essentially, the work we've been doing to allow us to move towards that uh, position uh, is the learner profiling and learning path development uh, that we've heard briefly about today. We did go into this in some detail in the last webinar. So if you do have an interest in this, I'd recommend that you have a look um, at the uh, presentations which are on join up. Uh, Katerina shared a link for that in the chat a little bit earlier on. Um, but to give you a, a very quick overview of what, what we did, essentially we needed to understand uh, the, the current position. OK, so we did a mapping exercise to find out what the sorts of roles and occupations of the sorts of people that might have requirements of interoperability learning were. Um, and to that end, we looked at uh, a various set of existing standards, uh, because of course, you know, we've heard this phrase this morning quite a lot, you know, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so we looked to some very specific standards in terms of digital competencies. So we looked at the European e-competence e framework, uh, which is related specifically to uh, IT roles. Uh, we looked at the European standard 164581, which looks at ICT professionals role profiles. Uh, we looked at more generic uh, competency maps such as Digicomp, which looks at the sorts of levels of core digital competencies you might expect across the wider population. But most specifically, uh, the core of what we looked at was ESCO, which is the Skills, Competencies, Qualifications and Occupations Framework. Um, and that formed the core of how we built the learner profiles, uh, because there is a lot of work done there. It's very detailed. Uh, Dimitrios will provide a, you know, a lot of uh, uh, insight into that uh, in a second. Uh, and it's really helped us develop a picture, if you like, a snapshot, because our learner profiles, we produce learner canvases, our learner profiles are snapshots um, of what uh, people face in their daily roles in terms of challenges, what their knowledge requirements are, skills and competencies. Uh, so that gives us a baseline, essentially, um, and allows us then to build on that, creating uh, example learning paths. Now, I do say, you know, example learning paths, because in reality, uh, every learning path, every learner's path will be different. Um, so we try to model kind of sample learning paths based on different sorts of learning paradigms. So we have a subject based learning path. We have a problem centered learning path. We have learner requirement based learning paths. Um, and again, all the detail is uh, in on the slides which are on join up. Uh, we're also uh, 
concurrently, so at the same time, we're also uh, running a, a study, um, a bit of research uh, on skills and competencies frameworks for the public sector that currently exist. Okay, so that will also give us another baseline about how these sorts of structures are working. Um, and then putting that all together, uh, what we hope to develop is a, a structure which will provide essentially it will provide meaning for people that are looking for learning on the interoperability academy so whether you call it a curriculum or competency framework that's how we're going to shape this uh, so if we could just move on to the next slide very quickly th this is just an example um, of uh, the learner canvas that we developed this this exemplifies um, how we have basically provided the snapshot the persona of our potential learners um, it is split into different areas. Uh, there is an occupational mapping. We then look at knowledge, uh, tasks, uh, and specifically digital competencies, all of which are mapped to those uh, standards that we saw uh, just a minute ago. Uh, and as you can see from this, uh, ESCO is quite central to what we're doing. So there's a real core link between uh, what we're doing uh, and the, uh, the framework that uh, ESCO has developed. The idea of this canvas, of course, is that it's a template. Uh, we've created 10 profiles. Um, we've done uh, CTO, we've done legal advisors, we've done counsellors, policy managers, public administrators, project managers. Uh, so what we try to do in those 10 is try and capture a kind of a cross section of the sorts of learners that will be using the Interpolity Academy. But of course, it, it is a template. So if we want to extend that work or if others want to uh, help uh, with that sort of uh, analysis, then this is available to do that uh, ready mapped to all of those standards. Um, so I think that's probably quite enough from me. Um, what I'll do uh, is pass over now to Demetrios uh, Pikios, who will speak uh, in a little bit more detail um, about ESCO uh, and the ESCO framework. Over to you, Dimitrios. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Dimitrios Pikios here. Uh, I'm the uh, ESCO project coordinator working in digital employment, social affairs and inclusion uh, of the European Commission, in particular in the unit dealing with uh, skills and qualifications. First of all, uh, I need to say that we are very excited about uh, this uh, project, uh, both about the uh, the dimensions of, of it, the importance, there is a lot of potential here, but also, um, I mean, looking at this very impressive work that has been done already up to now, we are very much looking into gaining from it as a classification ourselves, um, because uh, currently, and I will say one or two words about this, currently, uh, later down, currently we're working uh, for the new major version of ESCO, uh, version 1.1, .1, which will be published at the end of uh, next year and which will include uh, new skills that uh, may have appeared and uh, new occupations or new profiles that may have appeared since ESCO's launch, official launch in July 2017, maybe corrections and everything. So obviously this work that uh, was just described will be very helpful. So. Uh, with ESCO. Uh, ESCO is the implementation, uh, if we can go back to the previous slide, thank you. Previous, previous, thank you, great. So ESCO is the implementation of EU uh, policy in the field of the digital labor market uh, because um, thanks to the um, uh, digital revolution that has taken place in the last 10 to 15 years, um, we see now that uh, digital platforms like job boards, like platforms uh, uh, providing suggestions for education and training, um, social networks, they have become really central uh, to, the, um, uh, to the labor market and uh, they themselves, they have put skills at the center of their operations. So uh, with ESCO, uh, there are three um, uh, EU goals in the digital labor market that are pursued. The first one is to uh, improve the linking uh, between labor and education and training to make sure that uh, all Europeans have access to uh, the best opportunities uh, offered to them by Europe, opportunities for uh, new careers, for jobs, uh, opportunities for uh, education and training, 
um, for switching careers and everything. The second goal is to ensure the transparency of information skills uh, through systems interoperability because uh, systems, uh, they come uh, uh, from different countries in different languages. They uh, have different, maybe they use different standards. Also, the information that is uh, managed and exchanged by all those digital platforms uh, in uh, CVs, in job vacancies, in um, uh, education and training curricula, etc., needs to be fully understood uh, and fully trusted upon by all players in, in this uh, in this area, by employers, by job seekers, by providers of education and training, by learners, by career counselors. Uh, so we need to to ensure this uh, transparency of uh, information and skills. Uh, and the third goal is to make sure that all people have uh, totally open and fair access to information on skills, on qualifications, on jobs, on training. So we need to avoid a possible monopolization of data in the digital labor market. And for these uh, European open standards like ESCO can help to counteract possible risks of uh, proprietary standards. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here comes ESCO. ESCO took seven years to, uh, to develop uh, from its initial inception around 2010 until its uh, official launch in July 2017. And um, ESCO has uh, three pillars. The first pillar is the pillar of occupations. Uh, there are around uh, 3,000 occupations uh, that uh, are classified in ESCO that uh, come together with around 13,500 skills or competences and knowledge uh, concepts. And those two are pillars are connected to each other. So for every occupation, there is a list of skills and knowledge that uh, come with it, which can be seen on the portal. This is a screenshot from the portal of ESCO and also can be understood by machines and algorithms because ESCO is uh, published as uh, linked open data. Um, and um, also ESCO is available in 27 languages. Uh, all official EU languages plus Arabic, Icelandic and Norwegian. Uh, so all concepts are published in all those languages. For every concept, uh, occupation, skill, knowledge, there is a description of what the concept is about and below that the list of uh, essential and optional skills and knowledge. And these descriptions uh, up to now uh, were available only in English, but in the coming weeks, within June in any case, we will have the publication of those uh, descriptions in also all ESCO languages. Uh, the translation has been done already and now we are even concluding with uh, corrections by the relevant member states. For um, skills and uh, knowledge, uh, what happened uh, since the last webinar, the first uh, Interoperability Academy webinar, was the very important publication of our very new uh, skills hierarchy, which was built uh, with the help of experts, so it's an expert-driven uh, hierarchy. Uh, we see here uh, the very basic um, uh, structure of this uh, hierarchy. Of course, in the website, uh, there is a, a it's published uh, in its whole. Uh, it's divided in four areas, attitudes and values, knowledge, uh, language skills and knowledge, and skills. Uh, so, uh, as regards uh, knowledge, um, the, we followed the uh, classification of uh, ISCDF, which is the International Standard Classification of uh, Education of uh, UNESCO. And for uh, skills, we developed our own new uh, structure there, which has three levels. The first level has eight areas. Um, it was developed to take inspiration from ONET, the American classification, also from the uh, Canadian skills classification. But it really, it's, uh, it, it's a new uh, hierarchy. And it's, as I mentioned earlier in an intervention of mine, it goes beyond uh, occupations and sectors. So it really helps uh, the transferability of uh, skills. Um, next step, uh, slide please. So today, 
ESCO is uh, currently implemented uh, by a really significant already uh, number of uh, implementers. We have more than 60 implementers uh, across Europe with uh, which we are constantly in contact because, first of all, we need to understand how they use ESCO. And more importantly, uh, we need to uh, have feedback from them on how to improve ESCO, what to correct, uh, what to add, what to change in any case. And uh, today with me, we have um, uh, members of the ESCO team that uh, are really responsible for this. Uh, my colleague, uh, Laura Vizan, is uh, responsible for this area, being uh, constantly in contact with all those implementers. So first of all, we have the public employment uh, services of uh, all European countries, which need and have started already uh, the, doing that. They need to map their national classifications of skills and or occupations uh, to ESCO. Uh, and this they need to do um, by around August 2021. And the reason why they need to do that, it's a legal obligation, is that after August 2021, they will need to deliver job vacancies to the EURES network to be published on the EURES service portal using ESCO uh, terminology. Then we have uh, implementers in the very EU public uh, services like EURES uh, that I just mentioned, uh, like uh, the new Europass, which is also managed uh, in uh, our unit, Unit E2 of uh, Digital Employment. Uh, and it's uh, in the coming weeks uh, going live, the new Europass, very advanced uh, platform for job seekers and for learners. We also have SEDEFOP, which is using the ESCO skills pillar for their very important big data project uh, called Ovate, which is a, a project um, presenting very uh, important information around skills and occupations coming from millions of uh, online job vacancies. Then we have job boards, uh, we have different uh, implementations in the private sector for CV parsing, for uh, suggesting uh, trainings, uh, for, uh, for offering um, you know, online courses, uh, open budgets, etc. And uh, finally, we have uh, public employment services that are actually using ESCO in their uh, portals, like uh, the Irish uh, public uh, uh, employment service, uh, the Hungarian one, uh, the Icelandic one, uh, other public employment services like uh, the Greek one, while uh, they are using, uh, they have used ESCO in different pilots, etc. Uh, next, uh, please. The areas in which uh, ESCO is used are pretty much covering everything as regards digital applications. We have uh, skills-based uh, job matching. Uh, we have uh, validation of informal, non-formal, formal learning. We have ontology management and machine learning. We have curricular development, which is quite relevant here uh, today. Graduate tracking, statistical research, for example, what uh, CELDEFOP is doing, and career learning and development uh, management. Next, please. Uh, in the uh, EU public authorities, uh, very concretely, we have uh, EURES using uh, ESCO, we have the new Europass, which is also for learners, quite relevant to what we are discussing today. We have the EU Learn platform of DGHR, which is of particular interest for uh, what we are uh, covering today, because this is a platform offering uh, trainings to people working in the European Commission and um, uh, they are revamping their system and they are going to use ESCO uh, as the oil in their machine, matching uh, learners to, uh, uh, to courses. And uh, we did last year a very interesting pilot with them for uh, communication profiles for this. Uh, CEDEFOP, I, I already explained this. Um, and then we have a cooperation, very interesting cooperation with DG Education and uh, Culture, DGAC, for a pilot that they did and uh, we did our own pilot and now we are looking into synergies for linking um, descriptions of learning outcomes of qualifications to ESCO skills using artificial intelligence. We have also developed uh, our own uh, tool using AI and we're going to do a second phase of that pilot uh, with uh, a significant number of uh, member states and also external uh, stakeholders uh, beginning uh, in a few weeks. 
And finally, the, uh, uh, the Commission's uh, uh, Skills Profile Tool for Third Country Nationals, very interesting project also managed in our unit, which is about uh, um, refugees or other third country nationals uh, that need to document their skills. Uh, ESCO is also used here. Next slide, please. Uh, as regards uh, implementers, uh, particular, uh, you know, who are they uh, in this area, which is really interesting for us today, the area of uh, education and training uh, systems. We have, uh, as I mentioned, DG AAC, we have uh, the new Europass uh, in the public sphere. We have the skills profile tool for third country nationals. We have also in the Netherlands a very interesting public-private partnership, which is called the House of Skills which includes uh, private platforms and the public employment service, the Ministry of Labor over there. Uh, it's quite interesting. And then we have uh, a significant number of private implementers. We are going to see a few of them uh, in the following slides, a certified boosters. Uh, Ariston, a very nice um, platform in Greece doing psychometric tests, uh, and they use uh, ESCO. Uh, we have also the ADECO group in Italy, etc. And here, uh, the, the way that ESCO can help is uh, in the creation of uh, curricula for transparency and uh, uh, ability to compare, um, to create the learning outcomes, uh, skills passports, uh, to help with uh, career guidance, um, um, to, to, uh, to assess skills, etc. Next slide, please. So let's see a small number of implementers. First of all, uh, the Open Skimmer, the Open European Skill Matchmaker, a very interesting project that used ESCO uh, in order to provide the users with an itinerary, literally a route from job A that they are doing right now to job B, their dream job or a job that they would like to do. So a training or education path uh, that can have one, two, three, or four uh, trainings uh, that will allow them to reach uh, the, the job they want to do starting from their current job. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Boosters. Boosters is a French uh, company offering um, uh, products um, to uh, HR departments of uh, companies, allowing them to map skills within their uh, uh, organizations uh, in order to uh, allow staff to retrain, uh, to to um, to get to to acquire uh, new skills that they would like uh, to have for other positions in the organization, or also for those organizations to to understand which skills which people have uh, in order to staff, for example, new projects. Next skill uh, slide, sorry. Uh, eSkills Match, uh, also a very interesting uh, project, uh, identifying uh, uh, necessary IT skills uh, for people to be competitive in this uh, market and linking them uh, to, uh, open, uh, to open courses, and uh, they're using uh, ESCO for that. Next slide. Uh, Docibo, uh, it's an Italian company. They are in the same uh, area with uh, boosters and they also provide uh, products uh, that allow HR departments of organizations to do a uh, skills mapping within the, their organizations. Next slide. And then finally, uh, you know, a bigger number of uh, implementers here. Uh, the more relevant ones for what we're discussing today is, uh, for example, the Skills Board from France. They provide Skill self-assessment tools and open badges. Uh, Skill Lab from the Netherlands, they also provide self-assessment tools, and that is for suggesting uh, further training. Odem from Switzerland, it's an education marketplace using blockchain technology where learner profiles are created and matched with uh, learning opportunities. Uh, certified uh, from Germany, they identify skills of workers and link them to learning opportunities and digital trainings. And finally, uh, the Open Badge Factory from Finland, uh, they tag open badges, uh, open badges with ESCO skills and support validation of informal uh, or non-formal uh, learning. Uh, next slide. This is my final slide. Uh, so as regards the future, as I mentioned earlier, we are now working very intensively 
uh, for the publication of uh, the next major version of uh, ESCO 1.1. Uh, right now we are with ESCO 1.0, uh, launched in uh, July 2017. The next version will be launched in 22, at the end, very end of 2021. And we need to figure out, um, uh, we already have gathered a lot of feedback from uh, everywhere out there, from domain experts, from implementers of ESCO, from uh, corporations that we've had. For example, now we have this uh, cooperation with the Interoperability Academy. Um, with um, any kind of uh, stakeholder that can credibly come to us with suggestions for new occupations, for new skills, for links between profiles, uh, occupations, jobs with uh, skills. We have gathered all this. We keep gathering, of course, but we have already started analyzing the new content that will be published at the end of uh, 2021. At the, at the end of this year, we will do a consultation with all member states on the new uh, content. Um, uh, first of all, in English, and then next year, on the basis of the results of this uh, consultation, we'll do further consultations in the uh, individual ESCO languages with the relevant uh, member states, of course. Um, now, this exercise is done uh, pretty much manually, so we're very interested in um, the next um, update of ESCO after version 1.1, how to do it more in a more automatic way using artificial intelligence uh, technology. We have already some uh, initial um, experience through the pilot for linking qualifications to ESCO skills that we did last year. Uh, of course, we will look more into this uh, with our AI experts in the team, and we will hopefully be able to come up with a combination of data-driven and expert-driven uh, analysis that makes sure that ESCO keeps its mission uh, being uh, to be, meaning to be um, up to date, uh, to be really a common reference terminology, to bridge employment with education and training, and also uh, to be uh, to serve interoperability, to be useful uh, across languages, across systems uh, for all use cases, and of course to be always uh, uh, open data. If you have any questions, I don't know if this is foreseen now to to receive any questions, but of course we are always at your uh, at everybody's disposal for any kind of um, uh, discussion uh, and of course uh, cooperation. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Dimitrios, for for all this explanation about uh, ESCO. We will now uh, move to the last part of this uh, webinar. Um, and I will then give the floor to one of my colleagues, Constantina, that will present uh, to you shortly the roadmap uh, for the Interoperability Academy. So please, Constantina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ludo. Good afternoon to everyone. So the focus of today's presentation, as Victoria highlighted at the beginning, was to outline the progress we have made so far towards developing the IOP Academy, but also to emphasize the importance of collaboration and digital interdependence. So in this context, and with your help during the Q&A session, uh, we have mentioned uh, the progress uh, towards the developing the first course into the IOP uh, Academy, the EAF uh, course that Miguel mentioned, but also we discussed the synergies between the EU Academy and ESCO Academy. Uh, during the Q&A sessions, it was also mentioned um, some of the attendees mentioned and identified the, lead, the need to develop um, a list of the upcoming courses in order to enrich the content uh, of our academy. So our team is working intensively towards selecting more material that would be transferred to the IOP Academy in the upcoming months. Uh, as you might recall, and uh, during our conversation today, uh, you've had a look and we discussed about the catalog of the educational training resources, which can be found on JoinUp. And the purpose of this catalog, as a, as a reminder, is to aggregate all developed materials produced under ISA, ISA Square and SEF programs in order to create 
um, a unique access point to all educational interoperability resources, which will eventually be part of the e-learning platform down the line. So in order to coordinate and ensure uh, the implementation of these different courses and diverse material, we developed and currently fine tuning a rigorous methodology for evaluating the existing training materials on the catalog. Uh, this will help us to, to identify which materials could be transferred upon amendments uh, to, the, uh, to, to, the, to our e-learning platform. Uh, as you can imagine, and as it was already mentioned, the catalogs material are in a variety of formats and in different quality standards. So the selection um, will start with uh, relevant actions, reviewing relevant actions or building blocks, which will then undergo um, a very rigorous quality analysis. And uh, this will help us to order material in terms of their quality. Following these recommendations uh, will be given to the project officers in terms of the um, of the courses uh, in the format of uh, uh, shortlisted courses, uh, which will help us uh, identify in the end two or three courses or even more, depending on the effort that will be required um, uh, for transferring to the e-learning platform. So the upcoming months uh, are looking uh, busy for us, good busy in a good sense, because we will we will endeavor to select topics for the next IOP Academy courses with some important milestones in the way. For example, as you held, heard already, we are now releasing the first EIF course in the Academy. And after November or December 2020, we will release the second uh, course. Moving onwards from uh, uh, from December, we will continue identifying courses and preparing them for transferring to the platform. Uh, as it was already already mentioned, this is uh, this is a big undertaking, and it would require um, not only uh, the collaboration of the existing team in the uh, the existing IOP Academy team, but also it is really important to emphasize again the um, the interdependence and the uh, and the need to to collaborate and build bridges across uh, all organizations. So coming almost to the end of this presentation, I would like to take the opportunity again to remind you the different ways that we could uh, interact through the, uh, the Joinet platform. On the left hand side of the screen, you can see the link that you can join the digital skills in the public sector page. Uh, on join up, uh, you can become a member if you haven't done that, and you can share some information of our initiatives, comment on existing material. We heard some, uh, we had some very fruitful discussions here today about the catalog. So we would like, we are very keen to hear more uh, about that, um, but also tell us more about your needs uh, and expectations. Some of our uh, participants today have already uh, shared information about their um, national initiatives, but also uh, from the UN uh, University, and we are very, very grateful about that. But uh, we would like to hear more, and um, as it is already mentioned, we would like to, um, to, to create uh, bridges. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Constantina. Uh, yeah, we are now uh, almost at the end of this webinar. We, we are on time. We still have maximum 10 minutes in case there are uh, any remaining questions. So, so there were already some uh, question and answer that were exchanged during the presentation. Uh, but of course, if there is anything remaining, uh, that's the right moment uh, for you to, to, to ask any question so that we can still answer to them. And of course, otherwise we can still follow up afterwards uh, via join up, via direct emails, or also uh, via follow up meetings. Some of them uh, emerge from this, uh, from this webinar. So is there anyone uh, from the audience who would like to, to ask for one last uh, question about what was uh, mentioned in this webinar.
anyone. I saw that uh, some people were uh, raising their hands uh, during uh, the last last part of this webinar. Is there anyone who would like to to ask one last question, or should we just? Uh... This is uh, Raúl. I had my hand. Ludo, it's okay. Good morning, Raúl. Please go ahead. Yes. Well, good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to apologize because. I had a conflicting meeting uh, and um, everything that I have seen is uh, very impressive. So congratulations. I like it uh, very much. The very nice uh, and, and helpful presentation. So good job. Eh? Um, I just wanted to make a comment in relation to Barry's presentation and uh, kind of linking with the final presentation in relation to this roadmap of the Interoperability Academy. Just just wanted to share with you a vision um, which I think is um, basically supporting what you are doing and I would like to to be sure that uh, any of my comments is considered as uh, by no way uh, a different view. I completely agree and support that the between the different alternatives that potentially you have chosen this is probably the best one. OK, so I want to make that clear. No, um, I, um, what I see is uh, in relation to Barry's presentation is that uh, we have a challenge all um, in the sense of the learners and the communities of learners. And my concern is that we focus on the learners, the learners that we have today. And what I would like to suggest is that we have a kind of uh, uh, I would say long term view that what we want is to have now starting working on the learners that we want to have in 10 years. So when we are talking about uh, digital public services, I mean, what we are talking is about digital interoperable public services. And one aspect that I would like to suggest that is considered as a kind of checklist is the life cycle of a digital interoperable public service in uh, starting from the inception of the digital interoperable uh, public service, which is in policy making. So, for example, I would like to suggest that we are considering that as a checklist, for example, covering uh, digitally enabled uh, public policy making. OK, so definitely, you know, policy makers, some of them should be targeted to cover the whole full life cycle of this thing. And this is just an example. In essence, what I see is that the approach that we are doing is very much in line with in organizational literature is known as the garbage can model, which in essence means let's understand the solutions that we have and then look look for a problem that we have, OK, which is OK. It's absolutely OK to put in order in the house that we have. But also I would like to suggest that we have this complementary perspective of understanding what type of uh, interoperable digital public service or digital interoperable public services we want to have in 10 years. Thank you very much. And again, good job. Shall I just come in there, Ludo? Yes, please, Barry. Yep. Uh, th thanks for that, Raul. That's that's very useful, actually. Um, we, I mean, as part of the uh, occupation analysis, we have included uh, policymakers uh, and what their potential needs might be. Uh, but I do appreciate uh, the view that uh, this comes from both sides. And in fact, uh, curriculum design that there are tensions in curriculum design anyway, because when you're designing curriculum, there's always a tension between. Uh, what learners might require and what you have to offer uh, and the two might not necessarily balance uh, that well certainly at the outset uh, the point was made earlier on I think that uh, I think it was Professor Yanis actually that was saying you, you may get people coming in from different directions so they may not even have an interoperability requirement in mind they may have something completely different in mind <coughs> excuse me uh, in terms of digital learning uh, but interoperability will be part of that. So how do we know that and how do we know to deliver what they require as part of their kind of broader learning? 
so yeah there are absolutely lots of different perspectives here um and uh, you know part of what we will be doing will be looking at you know you called it the life cycle but looking at potentially how this might uh, map out in the future using things like the eif as as a kind of uh a guideline there but also you know the experiences of our stakeholders and that includes everybody including you so you know this is what we need to hear and we really welcome uh, any input that you might have in as we are building this over the next few months thank you barry uh okay there, there are four minutes remaining so we still have time for one last question in case anyone is interested uh by asking a last question, otherwise we can conclude this uh, webinar. Okay, so silence means yeah. approval usually. So yeah, please, Victoria. Sorry, <laughs> it's approval anyway. <laughs> uh, just to add to the latest uh, comment also, Frau, uh, we mentioned also in the beginning that our plan for this uh, action and project is to have something which is sustainable. So meaning sustainable, it will not be in the medium term, but also in the long term. So not to pr produce something like for the next two years, but something that will be continue and involve. And this is like our uh, our main target, I might, I might say. So in adding to what um, uh, Barry said. And I see also another question from Miguel. Yes, Victoria, very, very quickly, because uh, after my presentation, um, I forgot to invite everybody, at least uh, the attendees that joined this community of experts today, um, to join, um, to try to test the EIF learning module as soon as it's available, because uh, we need to get feedback from all of you, you know, to improve this. This is our first experience, so for us, in a way, we can be the guinea pigs. Um, any feedback, any input on how to improve it, what what is good, well done, what is not that nicely done, is going to be very valuable. So share it with your colleagues, um, test it, and give us feedback, please. Yep, we are definitely eager to get all kinds uh, of feedback. And also to stay up to date uh, with all the latest development, uh, please, of course, do not hesitate still to join uh, the Join Up uh, collection on digital skills, and if not done already. And probably then we can uh, close this webinar. Before closing it, I just would like uh, just again to thank uh, all the, the presenters first, of course, so thanks a lot to all of you. And also, of course, to, I would like to thank uh, on behalf of the whole team, all uh, participants to this webinar. So this was the second webinar uh, on the Interoperability Academy, and we will keep you informed uh, about the next one uh, that will be planned in this, uh, in this coming weeks and months. And of course, you know how to reach us, so please do not hesitate. Thanks a lot to everyone and have a really good rest of the day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye everyone. bye. Thank bye. you. Bye.